Indeed, the little book of Ruth, the little four chapter book. And uh, we're going to, this, what's going to make this session kind of fun, we're not going to be in a hurry. Uh, this book lends itself to fairly limited time. If you have just a, an hour or two or three with a group, you can have a delightful time exploring this little book. Um, we're going to take our time and try to go through it, not exhaustively, but carefully. And uh, I think you'll see one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so in love with this little book, the book of Ruth. And we'll take it, uh, chapter one, of course, to this time. Now, why do we study this book? The first reason might surprise you. It's one of the most dramatic books of prophecy in the Bible. It's also the, uh, and it's interesting, that the ancient Jewish scriptures sometimes group this book, not with the book of Judges, which it fits historically, but with the book of the prophets. And uh, the basic theme that we have in our entire ministry is that these 66 books are a single message system, an integrated message system, in which in every book and every name, every detail is there by deliberate design. And one of the lessons you'll carry away from our exploration of the book of Ruth is the discovery that every subtlety in this book carries significance to uh, not just the theme of the book, but much, much broader than that. Every detail not only carries this romance you know, along, but uh, it, uh, the romance of redemption, but it also gives us hints about God's entire plan for the human race. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, in fact, I often call this book the romance of redemption. This book, by the way, is studied in colleges that have no interest in the Bible particularly. They study it as an elegant piece of literature. It's studied in literature courses because just simply by the elegance of the way this thing is crafted. And I think that's provocative. It carries along several key concepts to us. One of the key concepts that it exemplifies is the concept of a kinsman redeemer. We're going to understand what that really means. Uh, kinsman redeemer. Because that is one of the titles of Jesus Christ we need to understand. And I don't think you can understand Revelation chapter 5 until you've really understood the book of Ruth, interestingly enough. Something else about this book is I think it's going to teach us a great deal about one of the most muddled up con uh, uh, concepts in the church today. The distinction between Israel and the church. It's amazing how many concepts we encounter in today's society and in today's ecclesiology that are muddled up about the distinction between God's plan for Israel and God's plan for the church. And this little book in the Old Testament is just a gem in that regard. Now, it, we're, we're going to take an approach, and we're gonna, I think this, our study is going to exemplify this approach that really fits any piece of Scripture. But this one's a, such a nice little contained package. It'll be instructive to, to see that there are multiple levels of study. The primary application in any book, of course, is its historical reality. It records a history that really happened. It's not an allegory or just a nice tale. It really occurred. In this case, it occurred in a very unusual period of history called the Judges. Judges. This is after Moses and yet before they had a king. This very, very uh, strange time that we'll explore. Well, that's the first level, just the historical or actual practical level. The next one, I should say, is the practical level. Some people would call it the homiletic. And that's the application to our own lives. When we study a scripture, there's usually the, ex, there's the exegesis, that's what does the text really say. Then there's the exposition, what did the text mean. And then there's the homiletic, how does it apply to us, our lives. Okay, it doesn't stop there. Then there's the prophetic revelations, the mystical or prophetic insights. What does this little book and that quaint little story back then tell us about the future? And it tells us a great deal, as we'll see. And then, of course, there's the, what the rabbis would call the remez, the hint of something even deeper. And uh, we'll, we'll discover some of that as we go. In the past, one of the ways I've taught this book would be to go through it and just read the history. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, understand the history. Then go back and see what it's really telling you 
under the current. And, uh, you, can, and you get a whole other perspective. Well, we're going to do all that together, I think, as we go forward here, because we, we're not rushed for time. And uh, something else the book is going to teach us a lot is about hermeneutics. That's your theory of inspiration. Every one of you has a hermeneutic. That is, you have an attitude or an approach or a belief about the text. And uh, some, some, many people have an attitude that's very broad, very casual, that, well, it's just a story, but it's useful. It's a soft, what we would call a soft hermeneutic. Others of us have a very strict hermeneutic. We think that it's designed by God in every word. And we, we have what, a, a very high view, a very tight view, a very rigorous view of hermeneutics. And that's every one of us will have something in between those two extremes probably. Now the Greek mind, most of us have a Gentile attitude, I'll call it the Greek model. We tend to think of prophecy as a prediction and it's a fulfillment. A passage that predicts something and then we see in history it happened. That to us is prophecy, prediction and it's fulfillment. That's the Greek model. The Hebrew model is a little different. Their mindset's a little different. They see prophecy as pattern. They study the scriptures in terms of not just what it says, but the pattern it's laying out. And they note with great validity that the history of Israel is a history, is a, is a profile of the Messiah in many ways. So they're constantly studying patterns. We do too. We call them types or anticipatory models. And our basis for that is Hosea chapter 12 verse 10 where God expresses very directly. He says, God says, I have spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes. Similitudes, similes, allegories, and so forth in the, by the ministry of prophets. So we're going to be alert to that. Now we're going to discover as we go, this little book provides very key pieces of a chain of references. This book establishes the basis for Bethlehem being in the Messianic story. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Because of this little book. When the shepherds are in the flocks by night that we celebrate Christmas, they're in the fields of Ruth and Boaz. Why? What's going on? Why is the city of David Bethlehem? I thought he conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites. But Bethlehem is known as the city of David. Why? Because of this little book. Okay? And the cross. Everything goes to the cross. This is going to, to underscore what really, in effect, happened at the cross. And the fact that Jesus is destined for a crown, a crown of David. And he's going to sit on the throne of David. All these things are, uh, this book is right at the pivot of each of these issues. And there are a number of basic, the, uh, the concept of a kinsman redeemer is going to be dramatized in the story. And of course, this distinction between the church and the nation Israel. These are all elements of things that we're going to be confronted with in very subtle and yet very clear terms. The book of Ruth. It occurs in the days the judges ruled. That's a key phrase. It's an opening phrase in the book. But we need to understand, what do you mean the days of the judges? And uh, we're going to talk about that. I'm also going to suggest to you the reason this book is so charming and so dear to me. It's the ultimate love story. It's the love story between Boaz, this wealthy landowner, and Ruth, who's a Gentile. Uh, and we're going it, to, it's a charming, elegant little love story. At the literary level, it's studied in college for that, for just because of its structural components. At the prophetic and personal level, it'll impact every one of our lives. It's one of the most significant books of the church. If you take the, if you ask me what book in the Old Testament is the book about the church, you say, well, the church is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Not it's not revealed in the Old Testament. That's true. Paul tells you that in Ephesians 3. And yet, what we really understand the church from is the book of Ruth. And interestingly enough, to the Jewish uh, pattern, they always read this book at the time of the Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, that we call Pentecost, because that's the feast that predicts the church, and it's linked in Jewish terms, strangely, to that very issue. The role of the kinsman redeemer, essential prerequisite to the book of Revelation, just to give you a perspective here. Now, it is in four chapters. 
The first chapter you could call Love's Resolve. We're going to see a resolution made, a commitment made, that is a model of this kind of a commitment. And that's in chapter 1, the main event of chapter 1. Setting the stage and that resolve. That's when Ruth, this Gentile daughter-in-law, insists on cleaving to Naomi. We'll get into that. The next chapter is going to talk about love's response. And Ruth is going to provide the gleaning. That will explain how the welfare of a destitute widow dealt with, uh, how that was dealt with in ancient Israel. And that leads to chapter 3, a very unusual request that is given and granted in chapter 3. That's the, the big scene, the big plot twist that comes in chapter 3. And the big, that's the thrashing floor scene that we'll take on there. And then, of course, the fourth chapter is Love's Reward. So we have Love's Resolve, its response, its request, and reward. For those that like seminary models, that their alliteration always seems to underscore, it must be true if it's alliterative. And I'm being facetious, of course. But anyway, the redemption of both the land and the bride occurs. What does that really mean? We'll see that in chapter 4. But to, to our challenge to kick this whole thing off is simply chapter 1. As I say, the, the, the scroll of Ruth is read at Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, and that'll be profoundly significant as we go. And um, that's the only feast of Moses that uses leavened bread. And the significance of all that we'll review as we have the whole thing under our belt. Let's just jump right in. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. The, the, the text says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So that's the opening shot here. This first sentence tells you what the incident is, where it took place, when it took place, and generally how it took place. Just like a good newspaper article, you got the first paragraph is the grabber, lays it all out for you. Now, the days when the judges ruled. What are we talking about there? The days when the judges ruled. That phrase opens our story. We need to understand the time of the judges. That was a period of time after Joshua had conquered the land. Moses and Joshua, we know the story. They conquered the land. That closes the book of Joshua. The book of Judges ends when Samuel, or you know, he's the last of the judges in effect, and he, uh, uh, the, the monarchy starts. In this period of time, it's a repeated time of failure. They fail to do what God says. They get into servitude under one of the other uh, uh, ruling uh, uh, pagan uh, forces there. They plead to God for a deliverer. God gives them a deliverer. They get delivered, and they fail again. And, one, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a half a dozen of these things, six servitudes, and uh, one after the other. It's a dark time in a sense, it's, a, it's a, re, a time of repeated failures. And one of the phrases that reoccurs all through the book is, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now when you see that just a scattered sentence, it sounds pretty good. But they did what they thought was right in their own eyes. You think that sounds pretty good. Not in context. They were doing what they thought they should do, not what God told them to do. That phrase is used in the Bible as a measure of darkness. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It's a negative, if you will. So the period of the judges is a, a pattern of repeated failures, but there is one element in the scripture that's the gleaming light, and that's the book of Ruth, because it occurs during that time. That's why it usually find, you find your Bible right after Judges, because it's at the time of the judges. And, uh, but the, if you study the book of Judges, it's one failure after another. So it's the era between Joshua and the monarchy, when the rulership was under the judges, not a king. It's also a time of scandals, by the way. There are scandals in the time of Gideon, and that's the time probably that this took place. Also saw Samson. We always celebrate the colorful pranks of Samson, but they, they didn't accomplish anything. They didn't accomplish much. Samson uh, was, a, you know, Samson's perhaps the best example of moral failure, moral failure. So it's not a spiritually high time, and Ruth takes place in that period. It's a contrast, if you will, to that period. So it came to pass in the time of the judges when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. 
Famines occur at least 13 times in the Bible. And the reason why the family leaves where they live, which is Bethlehem, and they go to Moab is, is uh, 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 really a, uh, that's why they leave, is because of the famine. So that also, in a typological sense, indicates the famine was a judgment of God. And uh, it also may have been a response to the spiritual condition in the country. That's a speculation, but one that can be defended. Famines took place in the, life, in the times of Abraham in Genesis 12, in David in 2 Samuel 2, in the days of Elijah, 1 Kings 17, in Gideon in the time of the Judges, chapter 6. And for a number of reasons, most scholars seem to uh, uh, come to the conclusion that this event occurs probably in or near and about the times of Gideon, if you will. And uh, so uh, the drought and famine were among the many judgments. God said he would uh, put on the land. It's a result of their failure to keep the law. That's Leviticus 26. says that four times. And Deuteronomy 28. The first half of Deuteronomy 28 are the blessings. The last half of Deuteronomy 28 are the curses. And, uh, and one of these things, if they don't keep the law, they could expect famine. And that apparently what was going on in that region at the time this family decides to leave. And so uh, the, uh, and the book of Judges, of course, is just a repeated uh, sequence of their failure to keep the law and the judgments that came and then God delivers them and it's, it's, that, it's the pattern. Now the fact that the drought did not affect Moab, which is close to Israel, separ separated only by the Dead Sea. So it's a region they could get at, about 75 miles away, and uh, that uh, was not apparently experiencing this famine. You know, I read a lot of these commentaries and a number of the commentators are really hard on this family. They shouldn't have really left. That part of their mistake was leaving and going to Moab. And, and people try to make it a moral case of that. I'm not here to disparage that. I think it's also a little unrealistic. There's famine. They're starving. They, there's another area where they, that isn't their land. They're, go, they're leaving. They're, they're, you, can, you can make a big uh, moral case that they shouldn't have left. But it was a yeah, practical result to survive, it would seem. And yet they didn't survive. We'll get into that. So it, it, this, it was a local family in Israel only. And that's why it seems to most scholars, most commentators seem to see the famine in Judah as a judgment of some kind. It had to be a very serious one because, you know, it extended over that whole land. Otherwise, they could have simply sojourned another part of Israel rather than leaving Israel. You follow? That's one point of view. It also had lasted for several years. It's another, this wasn't, a, you know, just a bad season. Several years. That's caused them to leave the land. Ten years was, are going to go by before the way is clear for them to come back. And that, that's part of the story, of course, when they come back. And so, uh, now the Midianites had uh, oppressed Israel for seven years. The oppression included the destruction of the produce of the soil from this famine that would naturally follow. And that's one of the reasons we tie this to roughly Judges chapter 6 as a time frame. Okay. A certain man of Bethlehem Judah. That sounds like a strange way to call it. Bethlehem Judah. See there's another Bethlehem up in Zebulun. It's re you only see it mentioned once I think in Joshua chapter 19. So there's more than one Bethlehem. Uh, so, but the, how, the book of Ruth, this whole story is about the one that's in Bethlehem that you and I know. About six miles south of Jerusalem. And uh, Bethlehem Ephrathah is another way you see it mentioned sometime. Ephrathah was the ancient name for Bethlehem and the name of the region, the, the area that Bethlehem, the town of Bethlehem, finds itself. And that's mentioned all through the scripture. And the, there shouldn't be any confusion about that. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn. Now that word we usually take quite casually. The word is ger, which means a resident alien. The root meaning means to live among people who are not blood relatives, be a foreigner. In other words, they left Judea to go to this place where, there was, where they could survive, knowing that they, would be a, they were foreigners there. They'd never be really accepted. Why? Because it's a different religion. They're still Jewish, trying the best they can to be Jewish, but they're going to go into the region of Moab, which is a pagan environment. And many commentators are very you know, uh, uh, judgmental on that. I don't have to share that view, but the, they, they, you know, it's a practical thing. He went to sojourn realizing that that would be a hardship on them, but at least they'd survive. And it's, uh, uh, 
so we have uh, the, yeah, the, pur the purpose of the trip was not permanent residency. They didn't have civil rights. They'd be dependent on the hospitality of the natives is the point. That's what the word sojourn uh, brings along to the, to the, to, into the country of Moab. Now you need to understand Moab here a little bit. Moab, you may recall, was the son of Lot. And the, the, res the result of an incestuous union with one of his daughters. Both, uh, you, you, you know, the, it, a grisly story there in Genesis 19. So, uh, uh, they, and also their history is pretty dismal. It's the Moabites that later on in Numbers 22 will hire Balaam to curse Israel during Israel's pilgrimage to Canaan. So they're adversaries. And uh, under normal circumstances, Moabites were barred from participation in the national or corporate life of Israel. Deuteronomy 23 expressly forbids marriage with Moabites. And yet this love story is going to be all about marrying a Moabite. It's going to be an exception to the general practice. And uh, there were nevertheless, in spite of all that, friendly relationships between some of the individual Israelites and the Moabites. An example of that is when uh, David was fleeing uh, from Saul. He found a friend in the king of Moab. So they're, even though they're still, they're, they're enemies in a sense, they're good, you know, they're, it was uh, salutary. Um, that same relationship, by the way, should be sensitive, is between Israel and the Persians. They have a history of, 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 of harmony in spite of the fact that they were at other times enemies. Now, the, okay, we get down to verse 2. The name of the man is Elimelech, and the name of his wife is Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Machlon and Chilion, uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem, Judah. Ephrathites is sort of the regional area that Bethlehem rides in. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. The name of the man, the name of his wife, the name of two sons. You get the impression, even the way the text underscores this, names are significant. They're not incidental. They're going to be a very key part of the story. The name of the man. Okay. Name of the man was Elimelech. That turns out to mean God is my king. And some, uh, some experts even say it means God is king. But the Maya is inferred. But it's an interesting name, though, because it's the name of Elimelech, God is my king, at a time when there was no king in Israel. That comes later. This is the time of the judges. Naomi means pleasant. Pleasant. And incidentally, as you just anticipate something here, Israel is sometimes referred to in the scripture as the pleasant land. So we can begin to suspect that Naomi somehow, idiomatically, is going to be an allusion to the nation Israel in some sense. Machlon comes from root kala, which means to be sick. His name means unhealthy or sickly. That's a tough handle to go through school on, right? Hey, sickly, you're on our team. Come on over here and be on our team. Doesn't work very well, does it? Huh? Hey, have I got a blind date for you? He's unhealthy and sickly, but trust me, it's going to be great. You know. It doesn't work too well. And Killian isn't much better. It means wasting or pining. He's the one that marries Ruth, it turns out. But anyway, all these names, by the way, appear in the Ucharitic text, which were discovered, that shows them to be typical names of, the, of that time. These are not unique names. They're apparently, uh, we, we encounter these names in some of the ancient archaeological discoveries. Not necessarily the same person, but those words were not unusual. Well, then the trouble starts. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, dies. And she was left with her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. That's quite a length of time. The women of Moab. Now again, Moab, you want to get the picture. Several times in the Psalms, God says, Moab is my wash pot. Or we might say, is my garbage can. Okay? And uh, so, Gentile marriage was forbidden in Deuteronomy 7. And uh, also in Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. So we need to be sensitive to the fact that it was not considered kosher to marry a Moabitess. But grace is going to rule here. Because by grace... All things are possible. And we could 
divert into a whole study of grace there. But you can go to Romans 8 and John 6 and Ephesians 2 and capture it on your own. And again, I want to remind you, Israel is without a king here. The name of the one that, they, that marries is Orpah. And it means like a, uh, uh, it has to do with a neck, but it has to do, it, it suggests a, a, a fawn or a gazelle, something graceful, if you will, Orpah. And the other one is Ruth, which means friendship or desirable one, okay? And uh, those are the two gals. Mahlon married Ruth, and Kilian mentioned Orpah. It won't matter much because they're both going to die. I mean, both the guys, husbands are going to die. But anyway, Jews were forbidden to ma marry Gentile women especially those from Ammon or Moab, Deuteronomy 7, Nehemiah 13, Ezra 9. That's a, so we're here now we're suddenly confronting a very, very non-kosher practice here. And, uh, and to remind you what happened back in Numbers 25 in Moses' day back then, a couple of generations back here, it was the Moabite women that seduced the Jewish men into immorality and idolatry. And because of that, 24,000 died back in Numbers 25. So, you know, this, this, uh, this is, apparently these Moabite women were very attractive, and they were the mechanism by which uh, Israel was seduced into idolatry back then. Just a footnote here. Well, Machlon and Kilion died, also both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons, Naomi that is, was left of her two sons and her husband. So suddenly she has, Naomi is really clobbered here. She's lost her own husband and also her two daughters' husbands, her two sons-in-law, also died. So she's really stranded here in a foreign land in trouble here. Now you understand when Elimelech left Bethlehem 10 years ago, he lost his property. He either sold it or he lost it through indebtedness. He somehow got disenfranchised, which is another contributing factor to their leaving town. That's a factor that's going to be very, very significant when we get to chapter 3 and 4. So, so the context here is the land was lost, and, and part of this story we're going to deal with is redeeming the land, whatever that means. How does that work? Okay. Then she arose, Naomi that is, with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard that the, in, in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. In other words, they're living in Moab, been there 10 years. The, the three men have died. She's got these two daughters-in-law. She gets word that back home in Bethlehem, things are better. The famine's over. There's a seven-year famine, and they've been there 10 years. That all kind of fits, by the way, what we think we know about the history. But now that things are better back home, She's going to go back home. When she goes back home, she's destitute. She's, she's a widow. And her daughters-in-law are widows. So she's dependent on a peculiar technique they had in that culture that we'll get to next time. How they, but to the point, she's destitute. But nevertheless, she realizes that at least the, God is blessing Israel. She wants to go back to her homeland. Okay. Giving, visit his people, giving them bread. Key word. What is the word for bread? Lechem. What's the name of the town? Beth Lechem. House of bread. Not accidental. Not accidental. It's part of the tapestry we're watching here. Beth Lechem. House of bread. Wherefore, she sent forth out of the place where she was and sent her two and, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So they apparently are starting to leave they, they've picked the on-ramp of the freeway heading back to Bethlehem, being facetious, of course. Okay. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead, that, are, that is their husbands, and with me. So she's on her way. They're with her. She's sending them, come on, you stay home. You, you, you don't want to go to our strange place. We're Jewish, and it's all Jewish there. You, you go home to your own mother's house and, and, and marry again, this is the concept. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And she kissed him, and they lifted up their voice and wept. 
To the young girls of that day, having rest meant having a husband to provide for them. Their husbands have died, but they're still young enough to stay in their culture and find a husband and have a life. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of your, her husband, that is, your husband to come. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. They both indicate that they're going to stick with their mother-in-law. This is not a place for mother-in-law jokes. Naomi's quite an exception here. These two girls are willing to leave what they know and stay with Naomi to go to this land where they're so Jewish. Which has, you know, that's not just a, a cultural thing. That's a deeply rooted thing they would be buying into here. Naomi now, and I wish I had the gift of uh, dialects. Some of my friends are so good at this, I'm not. But this coming passage, you really need to have a good New York dialect. Because Naomi is going to argue like a Jewish mother, okay? Naomi says, turn again, my daughters. Will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Okay. Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I'm too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, and if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay? <laughs> this is so, you know, so contrary to fact reasoning here. Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Ooh, that's an interesting phrase. That's not just a complaint. That's an ascription. Naomi realizes that the judgment of God has been against her. Her husband's gone. Her she sees in all this God's provision or lack thereof, however you want to put that, you know. But it's interesting how she's arguing with them that how stupid are you? You can't stick with me because if I, had a, if I should find a husband and we should have more sons and by the time they're grown, you're going to hang around till they're of marriage age? You know, you're, you're, you're going to be 20 years too old. Yeah, you, you see, the whole thing is... But notice that Naomi recognized that all that had happened to her was not pure chance, but the hand of the Lord. And the hand of the Lord is indeed upon her in ways she has no ability to, forget, for, to, to uh, anticipate. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. See, Orpah was going to stay, but Naomi talked her out of it. So Orpah is going to disappear from the pages of history. Okay? We don't know what happened to her. I assume she got back to Moab and found a neat young man and they had a wonderful life and who knows. But she's in oblivion as far as the text is concerned. They lifted up their voice and wept again, both of them. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. So Orpah goes back off the pages of history. But Ruth clave, that's an interesting word, tabak, which means to stick like glue. That's what the lexicon actually calls it. That's Ruth. You know, that's an interesting thing. She's a Gentile. She's a Gentile. She's a Moabitess. And she chooses to cling to Ruth. And uh, see, it's the same, the same thing that induced Orpah to return home as would cause Ruth to stay. The fact that Naomi will no longer have a husband or sons meant that she needed someone to take care of her. Ruth understands that when Naomi goes back home, she's destitute. She has no property. She has no, she has no husband. She's going to need someone to take care of her. She's getting older. Ruth is stepping into that role of serving her mother-in-law. She understands that she's going to need help. And Ruth isn't going to be equipped to do much else but beg or whatever they do. And we'll come to that next, in the next chapter. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Naomi is saying, you know, Orpah's got sense in her head. She's going back. You should go too, Ruth. That's what she's saying in effect. Okay? Notice this. Thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. This isn't just a geography thing. This is a religious thing. Your gods. What were her gods? 
Their national god was called Hamash. Numbers 21, 1 Kings 11. And among other things, to give you a quick snapshot here, they accepted human sacrifices. We are talking a pagan culture here. Okay, that's what they were brought up in, that's what they understood, and that's what Orpah returned to, okay? Now, by the way, this stuff is re found in the Moabite stone. I'll come to that. King Mesha wrote a Moabite stone. The Moabite stone is a black basalt memorial stone that was discovered in Moab by a German missionary back in 1868, okay? That's roughly what it looks like. It's about four feet high. It contains about 35 lines in an alphabet that is very close to Hebrew. A little different, but discernible. It was probably erected about 850 BC, called it almost 3,000 years ago, by a Moabite king, Mesha. <laughs> it's interesting. His story is written in the stone, celebrated his overthrow of the nation Israel. That's his version. The account in 2 Kings 3 makes it clear that Israel was victorious in that battle. But Mesha has his view of it. I'm reminded when I was in Cairo, I was stunned to see all these incredible monuments celebrating their victory in the Yom Kippur War, Kippur War of 19, what was it, 73? Uh, and, uh, you know, they got wiped out. Eric Sharon had the third... Egyptian army surrounded. They were totally at the mercy of Israel until Kip, you know, uh, um, Kiplinger, uh, that's not right. What's it? Huh? Kippinger. Kippinger, yeah. Anyway, he's dispatched there to unwind that because we wanted to give them something to hang on some. So it was diplomatically snatched out from. Israel's, you know, they snatched the defeat from the jaws of victory, if you will. Uh, but from the Egyptian point of view, they celebrated it like it's a victory. And it's a, so ironic, uh, so, such a, so contradictory to the actual history. Well, it's a similar kind of thing apparently going on here. But the passage shows that Mesha honors his god, Hermosh, in terms similar to the Old Testament reverence for the Lord. There's a parallel commitment, if you will. And the inhabitants of entire cities were apparently slaughtered to appease Hermosh. And uh, so, uh, anyway, very, par very par parallel thing. Now, the Moabite stone has profound biblical relevance. The reason I bring it into our study here. It confirms the Old Testament accounts, that is, the existence of these things. It's valuable geographically because it mentions no less than 15 sites that are in the Old Testament. That, uh, you know, they're alluded in the Old Testament, and the Moabite stone uh, makes reference to these. It also resembles Hebrew, the language in which most of the Old Testament was originally, that's Paleo-Hebrew, uh, the, the ancient Hebrew, uh, that it was originally uh, uh, written in. Now some pieces of that stone are still in, on display in the Louvre in Paris, by the way. If you're there, maybe something you want to look up. Anyway, let's get back to verse 16. Naomi's trying to talk Ruth into joining Morpah and, and going home. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or return from following after thee. And she now is going to express a commitment that echoes throughout history as one of the most eloquent expressions you've, you'll, ever, you'll find anywhere. So we're going to take a look at this very carefully. Here's what Ruth says to her. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. Wow, that's not a casual little Sunday school commitment kind of thing. This is serious stuff we're dealing with here. She was raised in Moab, an idol-worshipping Gentile country. She was abandoning everything, okay? And not because she was married to a husband. He's dead. But to follow her mother-in-law including adopting a totally strange way of life, from her point of view. She continues, Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried, and the Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. She's taking a death oath here, a commitment that goes to death. 
Wow! She also uses a very unusual word here. The Lord do so to me. Yehovah. Yodhe in the rabbinical terms. She invoked the name of God in her oath and not the name of Chemosh. You get the impression that she's learned a lot in the brief time she's been with Naomi and apparently her husband and so on. Sevenfold decision. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. Two different things. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Whew. Quite a statement. A similar formula you'll find seven times in the books of Samuel and the Kings. Eli concerning Samuel, Saul of, uh, of Jonathan's execution. These are all uh, Jonathan's friendship with David, David's concerning Nabal, David concerning Amasa, Ben Hadad concerning Samaria, and the king of Israel regarding Elijah, the, the, the death oath kind of thing. Anyway. But let's keep in mind now, there's an overlay on all this. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. They're not allowed to be part of that society. Even to their tenth generation. Remember that tenth generation thing. That's going to come up later. Shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever? And how can Ruth enter into the congregation of the Lord? How can she do that? Well, the same way you and I can. By trusting in God's grace. And throwing herself entirely on God's mercy. Which is what she's actually doing. The law excludes us from God's family. But grace includes us if we put our faith on our kinsman redeemer. But that's coming later. It's interesting too, another comment I'll make. The genealogy of Jesus Christ that we find detailed for you in Matthew 4 includes the names of five women, four of whom have questionable credentials. Tamar committed incest with her father-in-law, Genesis 38. Rahab was a Gentile harlot. She ran a house of ill repute. Ruth was an outcast Gentile Moabitess. She's in that list, if you will. And of course Bathsheba is mentioned by name, but the wife of Uriah is, and she of course was an adulteress. Four questionable credentials. Who's the fifth woman? Mary. But we'll go on. How did they ever become part of the family of the Messiah? Through the sovereign grace and mercy of God. God is, as Peter reminds us, long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Praise God. Let's go on here. When she saw that she was steadfast, when, when Naomi saw that Ruth was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking unto her. Now I assume that's a journey of about 75 miles. That's not a casual stroll, gang. You want to go on foot for 75 miles? And not straight or level, by the way. They would have to descend from the Moabite highlands to the Jordan Valley. That's a descent of about 4,500 feet, almost a mile in altitude. Followed by then an ascent to Bethlehem, about 3,750 feet, walking through desert territory through the wilderness of Judah. So a uh, non-trivial thing. But what interests me too, when they came, it came past when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. Now admittedly, Bethlehem was not probably a big burg. Estimates typically are in the neighborhood of 70,000. You know, trivial by our standards, and at the same time, in terms of a, a rustic town, non-trivial. And yet, their arrival stirs up a lot of discussion from the residents. That's interesting. All the city was moved about them. Is this Naomi? They haven't seen her for 10 years. She's back. Really? What's going on here? What Naomi says, that Naomi said to them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. So Naomi's got a pretty low morale here. Naomi means pleasant. That's what it means. So she says, don't call me Naomi. I'm not pleasant. Call me Mara. That means bitter. 
That means bitter. Go Exodus 15 gives you an exemplary of that. But she uses also an interesting word for the Lord. She says, for the Almighty, Shaddai, which actually it refers to a breast. It means the provider, but it also it thus becomes the label meaning the Almighty. Whenever you see it translated in your English, it'll be the Almighty. That's used 48 times in the Old Testament, 31 times in the book of Job alone. El Shaddai, El, God Almighty, Shaddai. God's Almighty, but he's de dealt very bitterly with me. I've lost my two sons, I've lost my husband, I've lost my two sons. She quickly will start counting her blessings. Ruth was with her, but at the moment she's really dragging here. She says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why call ye me Naomi, seeing that the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Heavy stuff. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. In the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, Naomi returned, Ruth the Moabitess, I guess we've, we've got that clearly, out of the country of Moab, so they come from this hostile land. They came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, one of the things the rabbis will teach you in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the text, when you see an unnecessary detail, that's a signpost that says, dig here. There's a treasure tucked away. You're going to discover there are all kinds of little Jewish indicators throughout the story that you'll miss as you just read it through. But I want you to notice, this is the beginning of the barley harvest. When we get to chapter 3, we're going to be dealing with the wheat harvest. And it's going to be useful for us to get a feeling for the calendar, the barley harvest. Barley ripened before, uh, ripened before wheat, began to reap roughly early March, but sometimes. But generally it's April or Abib in the, on the Jewish calendar. The barley harvest is the first hint of this story, this, this mournful tale, taking a twist. Let's understand the agricultural calendar of, 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 of Israel. It's amazing how many of our conceptions are uh, marginal at best if we don't really understand that calendar. We're on a Gregorian calendar. In our calendar, there's a region that we would call March or April. On the Jewish calendar, it's the first month of the year after Exodus 12, the, the month of Nisan. An earlier label for that same month was Abib, but that's the first of the religious calendar. God ordains that as such in Exodus 12. The farming calendar, this is the time of the later rains. That may confuse you because it's early in our administrative year, but it's the later years, uh, later rains on the farming calendar. And this is where the barley harvest starts and the flax harvest starts. The special days of Nisan are, of course, Passover. The 14th is Passover. On the 10th, they inspect the lambs, and 14th is Passover. And that's ordained in Exodus 12, but it, the details or celebration are in Leviticus 23. And then that also kicks off a period uh, of, un, uh, that we call the, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's Leviticus 23, from six to, verses 6 to 8. And then there is, in many, count, many of your references will speak of uh, the first fruits. That's not really the way it's actually described. Uh, the way it's often described in your helps is incorrect. In Leviticus 23, 9 through 14, it makes it quite clear that it's the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. That's a Jewish way of saying it's the Sunday following Passover. That was the Feast of First Fruits. It's always on a Sunday. Why? It's the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. Passover can be any day of the week, depending on the year. You know, the weekly cycle. It could be on a Monday or Wednesday or whatever. But whatever it is, the following Shabbat, then the next morning, is the Feast of First Fruits. 
And that's the biblical way of pointing to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so for what it's worth. Now if you were in the early church, the first few centuries of the church, and you attempted to honor Passover as a believer in Christ by using the biblical calendar, you would be excommunicated from the church. You were called a quarter decimens, which is the Latin for 14. Because the church was trying very hard to separate itself from Jewishness. And if you, if you tried to be biblical then, you were considered a heretic. Strange days. Strange days. Well, let's go to the next month on the calendar. April, May on our calendar would be the second month of the Jewish calendar, Iyar. Also early and early renderings rendered as Ziv. And uh, on the farming calendar, it's the dry season begins. The next month, May, June period, on the Jewish calendar, it's the third month of the year, it's Savan. Now, on the farming calendar, that's when the fi early figs begin to ripen and vines are tendered, uh, uh, tended and so forth. And it, and it has a special day. It's 50 days after first fruits. Nominally on the calendar, it's the 6th of Savan, but that it really depends. The main point is it's 50 days after first fruits which depends on where first fruits is, okay? And this is what we would, uh, this Shavuot is what we would call, what's also called the Feast of Weeks. It's what we would call the Feast of Pentecost. It's the Feast of Moses that predicts the church. It's the only feast in the, in the celebration of Moses that uses leavened bread, interestingly enough. It's interesting that the Jewish liturgy, the scroll of Ruth is always read at Shavuot which is the Mosaic feast that we now know is anticipatory of the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. How interesting that the little book of Ruth is somehow linked to the, to the feast of Pentecost. I think that's fascinating. Okay, the fourth month we would have called June or July, but in the Jewish calendar is Tammuz, fourth month. On the farming calendar, that's the wheat harvest. And we're going to encounter that when we get to chapter 3. That's where you also get the first ripe grapes. Note that. Your grapes start earliest is maybe in what we would call July. Then that brings you to the fifth month of their calendar, July, August. The month of Ab. And... Uh, uh, now that's when they harvested the grapes. Now what I find fascinating about this, I have read more papers trying to justify grape juice at Passover, or at the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a time of Passover, which is the spring. They couldn't have grape juice in the spring. They had no refrigeration. Let's get serious. The grape harvest is in the fall. If you want grape juice, great. You better get it in the month of August. Or it's going to spoil because grapes naturally preserve themselves through fermentation. It's called wine. It's interesting, by the way, there are special days in the month of Ab. The 9th of Ab is the date that is a day of mourning for Israel because that's the date that the temple fell. That's the date of the Kristallnacht. You can go through Israel, the Jewish history, and every time they are really oppressed, by the Babylonians or the Romans or the Nazis, what have you, it's always on the ninth of off. So it gets, so they get very, I'll use the term superstitious about that month, because that's always the month that seems to be picked for their being crushed. But anyway, uh, you might just remember the grape harvest is in the fall, because I think that is an important thing to understand. And that brings you to August, September, which is the sixth month of their calendar. And that's when the dates are harvested, and that's where the summer figs uh, are, are still being harvested. And then you get to September, October. That's the month of Tishri. An early label for that month was Athenim. But it's the seventh month of their calendar, if you're taking Nasan as the first month. Tishri was the first month of the Genesis calendar, but that gets all revised by God in the book of Exodus chapter 12. So this, uh, that's the month of Tishri. This is when they get the early rains. The, month in the, month, but the early rains are in the fall on, 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 on their reckoning. And they're early because that was the beginning of their original civil calendar. Special days, of course, the first of Tishri is the, is the Feast of Trumpets. 
The first of Tishri is also a civil celebration called Rosh Hashanah. Their civil New Year starts on the first of Tishri. But distinguish between Rosh Hashanah, which is a civil celebration, and the Feast of Trumpets, which is the religious uh, celebration. Ten days later, on the 10th of Tishri, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And then five days later begins a week-long feast called Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And so that's the, the fall feasts. You have three feasts in the spring in the month of Nisan. You've got Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. You have three feasts at the end of the cycle. Tishri, Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Between those two groups, you got this weird one. Fifty days after Feast of First Fruits, not after Passover, after Feast of First Fruits, you have the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. At which time the church is born, and also at which time the Book of Ruth is on the Jewish uh, reading list. How interesting. Book of Ruth, it's, it's going to be full of these little interesting. So, just as a quick summary of what we've seen, in the days the judges ruled, very, not, there isn't a king yet. Famine drives the family to Moab. And then we have all these names. Elimelech, God is my king. Naomi, pleasant land. Machlon, unhealthy, to blot out. Kilion, puny, those two guys die as well as in Elimelech. Naomi deters her daughters from following her. Orpah yields and doesn't follow. Ruth sticks, cleaves like glue to Naomi. So for your next session, I want you to read very carefully chapter 2. Because it's a very colorful, direct little story, and yet it is littered with little surprises hidden underneath the sentences. And I uh, also want you to study, one of the reasons the book of Ruth is so rich in, in, in illuminating us, it depends on understanding the ancient laws of Israel. Israel had some practices that are very strange. The law of gleaning, the law of the Leverite marriage, and the law of redemption. And this is the, the book of the Bible. It is legislated in the Torah, but it is exemplified in the story of Ruth. So I want you to study the law of gleaning. It's in Leviticus 19, 9 and 10, and Deuteronomy 24, 19 and 20, 19, 19, 20. What, How does the law of gleaning work? That was their provision for the destitute. If you owned an a, a area of land, you were allowed to bring, let your reapers go through it once and only once. Whatever they missed, you had to leave there for the destitute, the widows and orphans and people in need. Because they were allowed to follow your reapers and take what, glean what was missed. That was their form of a welfare state, gleaning. So obviously Naomi and Ruth, and Ruth because she's younger would do it for Naomi, she would follow the, the, the gleaners, and that was legal, and you were, you, you, it was against the law to go back a second time. What you couldn't get on your first pass was the property then of those that were in need. And that's operative there to understand the peculiar dynamics of going on chapter 2, except pay attention because chapter 2 has some very subtle surprises in it that set you up for the rest of the story. So that's your time for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. But this little treasure, little four chapter book, is a treasure. The more you study it, the more you discover about it. And so it's kind of refreshing to be able to go through it here with more casual time. Once you learn this little book, you can go through it with a friend around a campfire in an hour. You don't have to get into a lot of what we're going to get into to, to capture its treasures. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun book in that regard. On the other hand, it's refreshing to be able to go at it very slowly. We're going through, it's a little four chapter book and we're going it uh, slowly. We're going in chapter two this morning. And uh, why do we study this book in the first place? First of all, it's one of the most dramatic books of prophecy that may surprise many people. Um, in, the, uh, in fact, the ancient uh, uh, arrangement of Jewish scriptures had coupled the book of Ruth, not with the book of Judges historically, which it is now, but it was uh, compiled with the book of the prophets, interestingly enough. 
And it's not only, a, it, it's a charming love story, a, rom, uh, a romance, that is studied in colleges, not as a piece of the Bible so much, as just an elegant piece of literature. It's studied just because of its elegance as a story. But it also, once you understand what it's really all about, it's a romance, not just between Ruth and Boaz, but between the creator of the universe and ourselves. And that's what's so remarkable, the romance of redemption. And uh, it, it, it exemplifies a concept in the Bible that's all through the Bible, but here it's encapsulated as the kinsman redeemer. What do we mean by that? People who have not studied the book of Ruth are not prepared for Re Revelation chapter 5. You won't, study, you won't understand Revelation chapter 5 until you really understand the book of Ruth. It also deals with another issue, the distinction between Israel and the church. One of the great tragedies in our culture, our, our, our church culture, most churches have no grasp of the st distinctiveness of God's dealing with Israel in contrast with his dealing with the church. And you say, gee, the church is not revealed in the Old Testament. That's technically correct. And yet, of all the Old Testament books, the book of Ruth tells us a great deal about the church. And in fact, what's so strange is the Jews treat this book as part of their liturgy around the Feast of Shavuot. The Feast of Shavuot is 50 days after Feast of First Fruits. It's the, of the seven feasts of Moses, it's the one that anticipates the church. It's the only uh, Levitical feast that uses leavened bread, strangely. So there's a whole study about that. But the linkage of this book with the Feast of Weeks, or Feast of Pentecost, as we would call it, is rather provocative. But we're also going to learn some things from this book about hermeneutics, your theory of interpretation. Hermeneutics is simply your theory of understanding, your, your theory of interpretation of the Bible. Most of us, being Gentiles, follow what's called the Greek model. We think of prophecy as a prediction and then its fulfillment. The prediction that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, and then yet he was born in Bethlehem. You know, the prediction in the Old Testament, the fulfillment in the New. That's our classic Gentile model. You say, well, that's Gentile. Yes, but the Hebrew model is a little different, by the way. In the Hebrew mind, prophecy is pattern. That's why they study patterns all through the scripture. The patterns are prophetic of what's coming in a way that's very different. And that's one of the demonstrations that the Bible is the Word of God, because you discover that those patterns that are established thousands of years earlier are followed through history. That history, in other words, anticipates what's coming. And there's the study of those are called types or models are extremely provocative. And they all springboard from Hosea chapter 12 verse 10 where God says, I have spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Similitudes, allegories, analogies. There's several hundred different kinds of figures of speech all through the scripture. So the book of Ruth, it occurs in the days that the judges ruled. It's that period of time that is um, uh, uh, so early in, in the scheme of things. Joshua, uh, we have the Torah, the books of Moses, then Joshua. He conquered the land. Then the book of Judges, which is that bridge before the king. They had no king in those days. The judges ruled. It was a time of moral depravity. Again and again and again, the nation Israel was, uh, uh, fell away and got, fell into idol worship. Then they were oppressed. And uh, they, uh, in their oppression, they call for a deliverer. God delivers the deliverer. They, have a re they get back on track. And then they go through the same cycle repeats six times. Six different ser servitudes, and the, the book of Judges is a re pattern of repetitive failure. It's a dark time. One of the expressions that is used throughout the book of Judges, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That sounds good, but in the context of the Bible, that's l the, the, doing things in their eyes, what, what's right in their eyes, not what in God's eyes. It's contrast. So it's a, the book of Judges is a dismal period. The bright little gleam in that book, yes, there are these colorful stories of deliverers all the way through, Gideon, Samson, whatever. They all have their problems. But uh, the, the gleam, that's why the book of Ruth is usually appended to the book of Judges, because it happens that this charming little book is in the times of Judges. It's an exception to the general times. And, and, and that, so it's, it's the ultimate love story. Not just because Ruth and Boaz get together, 
but for a much broader purpose. It's a love story at the literary level, and it studies as such in college. If you take a, take a, a course in literature, it often will include the book of Ruth, not by, as, as a, a, because it's a biblical uh, revelation, no, just, just an elegant, elegant piece of literature. But it's very profound at the prophetic and the personal level, and we're going to touch on that as we go through. It's one of the most significant books for the church. That sounds like an oxymoron, because the church wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. It was given to Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. He was given the privilege of revealing that which was hidden in the past. When Jesus in Matthew 13 gives the seven kingdom parables, he says they embody things that were hidden from the foundation of the world. That means they're not in the Old Testament. What are they all about? The church, actually, surprisingly. Well, that's why it's sort of oxymoron. But yet we'll discover, for, you'll see why, that the book of Ruth anticipates the church in some surprising ways because it demonstrates the role of a kinsman redeemer. God's plan of redemption announced in, the, in Genesis 3 uh, is that God would redeem mankind through a, a kinsman of Adam. He had to be a man and that was God's program. What is a kinsman redeemer? We're going to understand that from this book. In addition to our understanding the concept of a kinsman redeemer, there's also uh, this whole idea of the Revelation chapter 5. And you won't understand the strange goings on in Revelation 5 until you really have mastered the book of Ruth. So, uh, and last time we have this remarkable event. I won't try to recap the whole chapter we studied last time, but let's refocus on Ruth's commitment. She's a Moabitess. Naomi's husband dies. Her sons, they both die, and their, their wives, their, her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Oprah, uh, uh, she, uh, they insist them on staying with her. She talks them out of it. Orpah does go back to her culture, the Moabite culture, which is a pagan culture. But Ruth is just in contrast to that. What a, it's, in fact, it's a strange thing. Here's Ruth. She is a Moabitess, not, a, not Jewish. She's leaving her whole culture to enter a culture that regards Moabites as pagans, as, as, as non-members, in effect. And she uh, commits herself to a life of destitution, to stay with her mother-in-law, who is destitute, going back to her culture in Bethlehem after ten, days away, ten years away. And, uh, but Ruth says, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. And then she gives this incredible commitment. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Wow, that's quite a thing. She was raised in Moab, an idol-worshipping Gentile country. and We won't lose sight of that all through the book of Ruth. She's abandoning everything of her background. And not just because she was married to a husband, but because she's following her mother-in-law and adopting this ver to which obviously a very strange way of life. She continues, where thou diest I will die and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if aught but death part thee and me. Wow, what a commitment. And Lord, she uses yod the the uh, the God of the, the Jews here and uh, in her oath. Not the name of her God which was Hamash. Seven full steps, whether thou goest, I will go, whether thou lodgest, I will lodge, thy people shall be my people, thy God my God, where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried, the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Seven elements of this commitment. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, many people regard it as the key verse, or verses to them um, in the book. So Naomi returned, and, Moabite, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. After being away ten years, having left because of the famine originally, they're now returning, she's, Naomi's returning, destitute, with this daughter-in-law in tow, come back from the country of Moab. And uh, really understand, you need the whole, to get back into the whole background of Moab, I won't repeat all that here. They came to Bethlehem, the house of bread, after being away ten years. And then we have this interesting closing phrase last time, in the beginning of the barley harvest, okay? And uh, the barley, you need to understand, 
to really appreciate not just the book of Ruth, but much of the Old Testament or even New Testament. You need to have a, a feeling for the agricultural calendar of the, the, the region. Barley was the first crop to ripen. It's the inexpensive, it's the low grade uh, uh, grain, if you will. Barley ripened before wheat. It began to be reaped sometimes as early as March, but generally April. So it's about uh, that time of year, the beginning of the barley harvest, okay? And it's the first hint of something joyful. This is sort of like the beginning of spring. This is that, that, that sort of little upbeat coming here, okay? Now the agricultural calendar we went through last time, I'll just review it so it's fresh in your mind here. On our Gregorian calendar, we would consider it about March, April in our year. The Jewish calendar is the first year of uh, the month of Nisan in Exodus chapter 12. God says, I want you to make this month the beginning of month. So he revises their calendar to make Nisan the first month. The earlier name before Babylon was called Abib, but it's also, they use the word Nisan. And the farming calendar is, this is the time of the latter rains. That may confuse most of us because we think of this as the early part of the year. But for them, agriculturally, it's the latter rains. The early rains are in Tishri, okay? But uh, latter rains, this is when the barley harvest, the flax harvest starts. The special days here, this is also the time of the spring feasts of the Feast of Moses. Passover on the 14th of Nisan, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days following that. And the morning after Shabbat, after Passover, is the Feast of First Fruits. And uh, so those are, the, are collectively called the season of Passover, but it's actually three different feasts that are detailed in Leviticus 23. The next month, April, May on our calendar, would be Iyar, uh, sometimes called Ziv in the early days. Uh, farming calendar, this is when the dry season begins. We have the early rains, the latter rains behind us now. And uh, we get to May, June, that's on our calendar. That's Sivan on the Jewish calendar. That's when the early figs begin to ripen. That's when vines are beginning to be tended. Special days here are Shavuot. F Fifty days after the Feast of First Fruits is the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. We call it the Feast of Pentecost because of Penny, the 50 days. And it's the feast, the only feast of the Feast of Moses that uses leavened bread. It's, it is anticipatory, of course, of the church, but that is uh, uh, a recent insight, so to speak. And on the Jewish liturgy, this is also the time the book of Ruth is read. So you want to link your thinking to this period of time. And uh, on our, as we move on in our calendar to June, July, we have the fourth month in the Jewish calendar, Tammuz. That's when the wheat harvest goes. And that's going to be a key part as we get into chapter 3 of the book of Ruth. We're in chapter 2 today. Wheat harvest, that's the first ripe grapes, okay? Then you get to July, August. We're starting to move into the fall here, aren't we? Uh, the Feast of Ab. And uh, that's the grape harvest. Now, this is something many people don't realize. Grapes didn't ripen until the fall, okay? So the special days here are the ninth of Av. That happens to be the month or the day that everything bad happens to Israel. The temple was destroyed on the ninth of Av. The crystal knock during the Nazi. You can go through their whole history. And almost every huge adverse thing always seems to come on the ninth of Av. So that's a, a time, a special time of mourning. It's unofficial, but that's what they do watch. But I want you to notice the grape harvest is in July, August, which means they had no refrigeration. If you want grape juice, it had to be in the fall. Because grape juice won't keep without refrigeration. Small point, I'll leave you to think about what that means, about having to do with Passover. But going on, the Gregorian calendar, August, September, that's Elul, and that's when the dates and the summer figs are harvested, and then you finally get to September, October. That's the seventh month of the uh, calendar. Ethanemum is the earlier name for that. Uh, this was the first month in the Genesis calendar, but revised, of course, to be the seventh month in Exodus 12. But the farming calendar is the early rains. The early rains are in Tishri. I mention that because for most of us, that sounds backwards, because we think of the fall as being the close of the year. Okay, In the farming sense, that's the beginning. That's when the early rains were, were in the fall. The special days here are the fall feasts, of course. The Feast of Trumpets on Tishri 1st. Uh, Yom Kippur, 10 days later, Day of Atonement, and then five days later, the Sukkot, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Tishri the first is also a civil uh, holiday called Rosh Hashanah, the new year on the civil calendar. Don't let that confuse you. It's a, okay, so there we are. Book of Ruth. 
It's in four chapters. Love's resolve, we could be at, at the title of chapter one. That's when Ruth was cleaving to Naomi, decides to cast her life with her after her husband, uh, after the both, all her husbands died. Chapter two is love's response, and we're going to see Ruth gleaning. What does that mean? We'll get into that here this time. And love's request, this re a widely misunderstood chapter three to the uninformed. We'll deal with that uh, on the famous thrashing floor scene. And then we have the big climax at the end with some full of surprises. Chapter four, the redemption of both the land and the bride and so forth. So we were in chapter one last time. Today we're going to explore chapter two of this elegant little love story. First verse, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, that was her husband, and his name was Boaz. A mighty man of wealth. You know, the Hebrew implies much more than that. He's a kinsman. He's a relative. The term also implies a history of valor and strength, not just wealth. All three concepts are suggested in the word that's used there. So he's apparently had a distinguished warrior background. That would be suggested by that term. He's strong in strength. In fact, his name is used as one of the pillars of the temple, we'll discover. He's of the family of Elimelech. That's of the husband that passed away, Naomi's husband that passed away. Very important to understand as, as the story progresses what we mean by a kinsman, what it really means. And uh, so this means, by the way, that this man of wealth, this man of valor, he, he, is, he potentially could be a kinsman redeemer. And that's what's going to emerge here as a story. Uh, he is of the tribe of Judah. And uh, that's what links, that's what's going to link the tribe of Judah with Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem because of this story. Or putting it the other way around, the story occurs in a way of protecting the messianic line, we'll discover. And uh, so the name of this mighty man of wealth is Boaz, which means, incidentally, in him is strength. It fits his background here. And uh, his name is not only important just in this book of Ruth. His name was chosen by Solomon many years later for one of the two pillars of the temple. So you need to begin to realize, this is, he's the hero of the piece. This guy is going to turn out to be uh, 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 much more than seems on the surface. So the plot's getting thicker here. You can almost consider chapter 1 and chapter 2 the setup for the plot that's coming in chapter 3. Now, just to insert a couple of qualitative assessments here, we too, you and I, have a kinsman who was made like we are. He was human. Jesus, yes, was God, but he was also human. We need to understand that. Yet he was sinless. Hebrews 7 emphasis, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He was man, completely man, completely tempted as we are, but sinless. He's the one that is able to save us to the uttermost. So there's a parallel, I'm going to suggest, between our kinsman redeemer and the role that Boaz plays in this romance. Now the name Boaz means strength. He was a mighty man of wealth. It can also translate a mighty man of war, a mighty man of the law. All three things apply here. And how interesting it is that they apply in a, with the decimal point moved over in the kinsman that we, we ascribe to. So anyway, in any case, Boaz is the hero of this piece, just as Jesus Christ is the hero of our piece, if you will. Verse 2, the, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, let me now go down to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now that's a high risk move here, by the way. Remember, this is the time of the judges. Sending this young girl out on an errand like this was not free of risk. We need to understand that as we go in here. Glean. Now, you and I miss what's going on here unless we understand the welfare system in ancient Israel. The welfare system of those days, if you were a landowner, you were a farmer, you were allowed to make only one pass through your field at harvest time. You could not go back a second time. That was forbidden, so to speak. The concept was that the, what the reapers missed on the first pass, or what they spilled, was left for the widows and destitute. That was the concept behind their economy. 
You raised your grain. When it was ready to harvest, you made one pass through it. What you missed, for whatever reason, was left for the widows and orphans and what have you. Okay? That's the concept they had. The law of gleaning, it's called. You'll find it detailed in Leviticus chapter 19 and Deuteronomy chapter 24. And we'll pause here, since we have plenty of time for this chapter, to, d to take a look at what this says. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, ye shall not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. Thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. You know, there's an old Latin proverb that says that providence assists not the idle. We sort of ignore that in our welfare system, but here the concept is if you're on welfare, fine. If you don't work, you don't eat. So that was the, the concept here. In Leviticus, it picks up the same echo. It says, When ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Interesting. And, and the Deuteronomy picks this up. When, when thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Okay? When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the, field of Egypt, in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. In other words, remember the roots. Remember where they came from. So in chapter 3, uh, chapter 2, verse 3 I should say. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on the part of the field belonging, un belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now she didn't know that at the time. She's out there. The fields are not marked. They didn't have fences. They had little stones that would indicate they, the, 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 what the boundaries were. And she didn't know some of these people may or may not be that hospitable, despite the laws. But she came and gleaned in a field after the reapers. And the way the scripture has here, a very interesting little word. Her hap was to light on the part of the field belonging to Boaz. The word is migrate in the Hebrew. Unforeseen meeting or event, accident, happening, chance, fate. We would say it happened or it's happenstance. She happened. It was just coincident that she happened to pick the field that belonged to a member of of the family clan. Did she know that? No. But you see, that this gets into another concept that's important for us to understand. Coincidence is not a kosher word, as some people would say. Or other people would say, coincidence is when God is working undercover. Okay? There is a discovery in the field of mathematics that you may need to be aware of. Let me just shift here a little bit. And of course, what makes this all so relevant is she happened to be on the field of Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. So he's a kinsman. That's going to turn out to be key to the whole story. There is an advanced field of mathematics. One of the most advanced fields, most recent fields, is chaos theory. That's one of the latest areas of study in advanced math. It's known as chaos theory. It's based on the elusiveness of randomness. We think of randomness as readily available. It turns out you can't find a random number. See, what any procedure to get a random number is a procedure, non-random. You see, that's, the, that's the, the dilemma you get into. There are two mathematical concepts that we encounter in the field of mathematics that we cannot find in the physical universe. One of those is infinity. That's where two parallel lines finally meet. We know they never do meet. So, infinity is elusive. And one of the great discoveries of 20th century science is that the universe is not infinite, it's finite. That has staggering implications. But the other thing that most people don't realize is another thing we cannot find in the physical universe. That's true randomness. True randomness is very elusive. Let me go into that. See, chaos theory describes the behavior of certain dynamical systems that are highly sensitive to initial conditions. They speak of the butterfly effect. How a butterfly flipping on one side of the world can create a hurricane on the other side. That's sort of the, the concept that's embraced here. 
And as a result of the sensitivity, which manifests itself as an exponential growth of perturbations in the initial conditions, the behavior of chaotic systems appears to be random. This is like smoke curling out of a smokestack and so forth. There's all these kinds of examples that are not really random, it turns out. And these, these systems are regarded as deterministic, meaning that their future dynamics are fully defined by their initial conditions, with no random elements involved. Their behavior, thus, is called, that's one of the kinds of a a chaos called deterministic chaos, or, or simply chaos. In the information sciences, randomness, or entropy, mathematics are divided into two kinds. There's deterministic and stochastic. Most of us have learned that 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's deterministic. Most, of, most engineering courses, all the way into advanced engineering, are deterministic. F equals MA, whatever. Stochastic equations are where the variables are, have some random elements. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Up, well, what do you mean? You mean 2.0? 2.1? How accurate is your 2? If, you're, if your 2 is, yeah, or if, it, if there's two estimates, approximately 2 and approximately 2 equals so approximately 4, what's the range of variability? See, suddenly you're dealing in something other than it's deterministic. Those are called stochastic. So if you're looking for a random number, it turns out the way you get it is by getting what appears to be what may be adequately random for your purposes. Those are properly called a pseudo-random number because you can't find a true random number. It turns out as you try to do that, the very method you use is not random. The Rand Corporation, the, th the granddaddy of all the think tanks I was involved with many years ago, in 1955 published a book at the time which was a milestone. The book was called One Million Random Digits with 100,000 Normal Deviates. I have one in my library. And it actually is a book. You, you, you pick that up, you think, this is a joke. Here's a book, you open up this book, and it's full of random numbers. And that was, that was a milestone in its day. Because you don't understand how hard it is to get a random number. What did they do? They used supercomputers at the time and worked and worked and worked to make sure that each number was not predictable. There was no periodicity. There was no uh, uh, periodicity, no symmetry. And so this is not as trivial as it sounds. It, was a ma it, it represented a great deal of computation to make sure that the numbers had no predictability. They were truly random. What's the defining characteristics? The total absence of design. Design and randomness are opposites in the information sciences. That's what's so absurd in our culture today where they attribute design to randomness. That's a contradiction in terms. It's the height of absurdity. So when you see design, you recognize it instinctively. There's designing taking place. I usually talk about the beads of Waitangi. These 347 beads I spilled on the floor, I put them on a string and, ooh, it's spelled out Genesis 1, verse 1 in Morse code. And if I try to tell you that happened handedly, you laugh at me because obviously you know that's impossible. Because you wouldn't, to get that turns out to be statistically virtually impossible. And so what I guess I'm saying is the point is we recognize design as deliberate, okay? A mousetrap has five key parts. A platform, a spring, an arm, a trigger, you know. And if you have only four of the five parts, you don't catch four-fifths as many mice. You catch zero. There's a thing called irreducible complexity. Without that basic complexity, you don't have a mousetrap. So there are systems that in which there are hundreds of parts, any one of which is missing, it doesn't work. That tells you it's designed, you see. And that make, that's just common sense. And yet, the, so the point is, randomness is the opposite of design, so for what it's worth. We now discover that our planet is not only uniquely positioned for life, we call it the anthropic principle, we now, it's not only designed for life, it's designed to be discovered. It's positioned in the galaxy. It's positioned for total eclipses, opened up the whole field of spectral, uh, 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 spectrography. And uh, it's positioned within the, we, as we study it, we not only discover it makes life possible, it was designed to be discovered. Our position in the galaxy, if it was anywhere else, we wouldn't be able to, to discover what we, and it goes on and on and on. It implies teleology, that means a purpose, not only is designed, design has a specific purpose, and that purpose is not only for life, it's for, it's to, to discover God, interestingly enough. Privileged planet, very key milestone. Anyway, that's exactly what the Bible points out, by the way. The reason I'm going through this extended thing here is in Proverbs 16.33, it says, The lot, 
the, rent, the chance, the dice, whatever, is in the, the lot is cast in the lap, but the whole disposing there is of the Lord. There is no such thing as randomness. That's exactly what Einstein said. He's, one of his famous quotes is, God does not play dice. You know why he doesn't? Because if he did, he'd win. <laughs> okay? Because he knows in advance what's going to happen. So there are two imputed concepts that are elusive in our physical world. Randomness is one of them. We have stochastic versus deterministic processes. We have pseudo-random numbers because we can't get a true random number. And the whole field of chaos theory uh, deals with this whole contradiction. And of course, infinity. We discovered the great discovery of 20th century science is that the universe on the largest, in the sense of largeness, is a finite universe. It may be big and expanding, but it's finite, not infinite. Staggering discovery, but definitely made. Also, what's even more amazing is on the microcosm. That if we look smaller and smaller and smaller, we get to a point where things are indivisible. We discover that our universe is made up of, in, whether it's length, mass, energy, time, are made up of indivisible quanta, as they call them. And that means we are in a digital simulation, a simulated environment. That's a whole study in some of our stuff. Anyway, so here is Ruth, and she just happened to stumble on this field that belongs to a kinsman. She didn't know that at the time, but upon this little, little coincidence hangs the whole tale and hangs the reality of Jesus being born in Bethlehem, as we'll see. Anyway, behold, Boaz, he happened, now he's the owner, he happened to swing by here. Then Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. They answered him, The Lord bless thee. There's management and labor. The management says, The Lord be with you. And the organization bellows back, so to speak, The Lord bless thee. That communicates a great deal. You can be cynical and say, well, that was just the style of greeting in that day. That may well have been. But it certainly seems a contrast to the environment of the time of the judges. And it certainly speaks well of the environment that we're dealing with, as will be confirmed by other things that happen here. And Boaz came in now. He's the lord of the harvest. He's the big boss. He's showing up here. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? He notices this young gal, his servant. One of the questions that we normally leave until after you know the whole story, but I'm going to give you a peek inside by asking this question early. What's the, who was the one that introduced Ruth to Boaz? And it turns out as you study this issue, you'll discover he's unnamed. We don't have a name. We have a name for everybody else. Remember all these names you went through last time? We have the names of the husbands and the wives. We went through all that last time. What's the name of the servant? It turns out he's an unnamed servant. And that, to those of you that are diligent students of the Bible, that should raise a underline. What does that mean? Okay. See, what was the servant saying? He is introduced to Boaz. She's introduced to Boaz by an unnamed servant. What makes that provocative, that's exactly what happened to Abraham when he sent his unnamed servant in, in Genesis 24, to go get a bride for Isaac, an unnamed servant. There, we can do a little homework and figure out his name was Eliezer. But it's not in the story. He's unnamed. Okay? And uh, why is he unnamed? Because whenever the Holy Spirit is in a model, in a type, or in a role here, he never testifies of himself. That's what Jesus said in uh, John 16, verse 13. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come... He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit never speaks of himself. And it fascinates me as just an architectural aspect of the Bible, is that every time the Holy Spirit is in the, or somebody's in the role of acting in the role of the Holy Spirit, he's always unnamed. In Genesis uh, 24, Abraham's servant is unnamed. Now, you could, by doing some homework, you can find out his name is Eliezer. What does Eliezer mean? Comforter. Comforter. How interesting that. And that's profoundly significant when you study Genesis 22 and Genesis 24 in terms of the Akedah and the, the getting of a bride of Isaac and all that, that Abraham is the type of the father. 
And Isaac is in the type of the son. And Eliezer is a type of the Holy Spirit. We have the Trinity modeled there in some very interesting ways. Well, here again, with all that background that you've had from your Genesis commentary, hopefully, um, here we have an unnamed servant. That should set up a, a, uh, an alert in our minds here. So, and the servant that was set over the reaper's hand said, it is the Moabitish damsel. There it is, that Moabitish. She, she's a Gentile. That came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. So he was the guy, he's the guy in charge here. And Na'ar is the Hebrew word. He's the foreman of the group. And he was responsible to supervise the workers, supply the provisions, and pay them at the end of the day. That was his job. And he, he's recounting to his boss, Boaz, he says, And she said, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. There was a little shed and stuff, a place where they could take a, a break during the heat of the day. And she apparently tarried there like the others would have. So she apparently had asked the foreman permission and he granted it. But he's getting that confirmed because the big boss is just going by. Get the picture. Okay. He not only endorses it, he goes even further. We'll see here in a minute. Then said Boaz unto Ruth... Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. This is a privilege not normally extended. She, he has his employees, his maidens, working there supporting the reapers. He's telling her, not only can you glean, but you stay here with our gang. That's a form of protection, a, por a form of hospitality that's unusual to the situation. And he... Go not glean another field. What do you suppose is going on here? Well, I take it that the Moabitish gals are pretty good looking gals. I get that from what Balaam counts at Balak. To, to, you know, the, the Moabitish apparently were pretty good looking gals. But anyway, she apparently has quite a good reputation. He has heard about Ruth having associated with... Bethlehem was a buzz about all that, if you may recall, in the last chapter. So he knows about her. He's heard about her, and she has caught his eye. Now, now, nothing inappropriate here. He's just got a favoritism, apparently, here. He goes on. This invitation is to, to, to continue gleaning in his fields permanently. Not just today. This is the barley harvest. In a couple of months, the wheat harvest. She is to endure. She's got an open invitation to glean, as the law provides, in Boaz's fields. And she was free to continue then through the barley harvest, which included uh, March and April. And all the way through the wheat harvest, which would be May and June. So she's gained here a franchise, if you will. And he continues, Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Really? She's getting some privileges here. One, she's supposed to stay in this field. She is free to follow immediately after the servant girls, which her pickings would be the most numerous. That's the favored position. And his intervention and provision, he's put out the fix. He's put the word out. No monkey business. She enjoys his protection. She understood this. What does she do? She fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger, a foreigner, a Moabitess? She's not even Jewish. There's a Hebrew play on words here, by the way. It's sort of like this. You have noticed the unnoticed. See, you have knowledge me even though I'm an unknowledged one or a stranger, see? You have noticed the unnoticed. And what's the basis of all of this? Grace. What's our basis with our kinsman redeemer? Same thing, grace. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. He's impressed. With, see, he's done his homework. Her reputation has preceded her here. So he continues, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Whew. 
pretty neat. She's got a tremendous, uh, you know, shelter, uh, umbrella over her, if you will. Then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaids. Boaz said unto her, at mealtime, come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. He serves her lunch. And by the way, he served her lunch. The word vinegar there is chometz, which is a drink made from sour grapes. So it's a, like a sour wine in a sense, okay? It's a, it's a, a, a form of uh, uh, refreshment. Bear in mind, they had no refrigeration, okay? And those grapes would be from last August. Got the picture, okay? And it, when it says he reached her parched corn, uh, tzabat is the word. It actually means he reached with his own hands. So here the landowner is treating her to lunch, is what's going on here. But she did eat and was sufficed and left. In fact, not only was she sufficed, she even brought some extra that she had back to Naomi of the, of the lunch. We'll see in a minute. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean, even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. In other words, if she inadvertently wanders where she shouldn't, don't sweat it, okay? The Hebrew here is very emphatic. Even between the sheaves she may glean. Now it was unusual for a gleaner to be allowed to pick up grain this close to the harvesters. They're normally permitted to glean only after the harvester. You get the idea. The concept was the harvest, you know, the, 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 the people earning their rent and groceries go first. What's left over was for the welfare. Here he's saying, don't sweat it. If she gets where she shouldn't, be that as it is. That's no problem. But he goes further. This, I love this verse. And let fall also some of the handfuls on purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. I love this verse because very early in my ministry, I found people uh, sending me notes. They felt that our Bible studies always leave handfuls on purpose. <laughs> they use that expression as a compliment to some of our... That's why I always remember this as one of the little twists that some of our uh, subscribers used to allude to here. Handfuls on purpose. Tzavathim. Tzavathim. Which means handfuls of ears themselves. And it's only used here in the Hebrew Bible. It's the only place that word shows up. And they are to pull out handfuls of stalks here. This is, the, if you visualize someone growing a handful before the, the scythe cuts it off, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, it's, the, it's what's in the left hand when you're cutting it down with the right hand. That's what a handful on purpose really represents. What this says in our vernacular would be, the fix was in. She's being taken care of. So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out that which she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Now, what's an ephah, okay? Ephah is about nine gallons. Give you a rough feeling for this. Ten ephahs make 90 gallons, according to Ezekiel 45. And if Josephus' computation of a bath of, or ephah is, as, is right, then that's, we're about right there. A dry measure of about one bushel comes close to this. It corresponds to a bath in liquid measure and the standard for measuring grain. And so it was a, vol a standard volumetric measure in the agricultural world, an ephah. If you look at it as like, about, you know, like a bushel or about nine gallons, we're, we're close. And she took it up and she went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she'd gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that she, she had reserved after she was sufficed. In other words, she had some left over from lunch that she also gives her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law, her suspicions are out. What's going on here? This gal's brought back a bunch. She hath reserved after she's fed. She brings back about 30 pounds of barley. For the two of them, that's, that's almost enough for a week, for the two of them, in one day. So she's done well. And Naomi, obviously, is a good Jewish mother. I understand that. And she also had, gave her some of her leftover provisions from lunch. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Ding! 
Ruth may not understand what's going on, but a good Jewish mother picks up on this, okay? Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin to, unto us, one of our next kinsmen. He's not actually the next. That's the plot problem we're going to get into at the end of chapter 3. But this is suddenly the fog lifts. Now we're beginning to you know, sense wh where this is going. He is one of our next kinsmen. The word is goel, and now Boaz is connected with the concept of a kinsman redeemer. This is where the plot, the plot thickens in terms of the romance. It also, the fog lifts in terms of its relevance to you and me today. And Ruth the Moabite has said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. Wow. Naomi's not stupid. She's figured out what's going on here. This guy, she has caught his eye. Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, and that they meet thee not in any other field. You know, you got the picture. You got to see a good thing here. Stick with it. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest. A couple more months after that. There's two different harvests we're dealing with here. And dwelt with her mother-in-law. She stays living there. There's no uh, changes in that regard. Unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest. The last chapter closed announcing the beginning of the barley harvest. This chapter closes with the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat. So we're going to get a, we got a few months going to transpire here. The barley harvest is the time of Passover, the first of the Mosaic feasts of their religious year. The wheat harvest is about 50 days after the barley harvest at Shavuot or Pentecost. And, uh, and this is, it, it is at Shavuot that this book is required reading in the Jewish community. That's their association. If you ask them why do they read it then, they'll say, well, because it's all tied to these harvests. That's only part of the reason. Now, we've talked about the law of gleaning in this chapter. There are two other laws that are going to become very important. And so I thought we could, since we have a little time here, we can just review these. This is your homework for next time, is to read Leviticus 25, verses 47 to 55. See, Israel belongs to God. When Joshua entered the land, it was granted to the twelve tribes. That land was to stay with the tribe, okay? When you sold land, you didn't, give it, you didn't sell it in fee simple as we think of it in our culture. It was actually what we would consider a lease. You could sell the use of that land for whatever period of time transpired from then to the land year of the Jubilee. Every 50 years, all land returned to its original owners. What you dealt with, what in our, in our vocabulary, would be leases, not, not sales in the, in, in the fee simple sense. And so, when you sell your land, it, as I say, it, uh, you sold just the rights to use it for a while. And in the year of Jubilee, every 50 years, the land would return to its original owners. Now, it happens they never really observed that. That's a whole other problem we don't have to get into here. And when you sold your land, the title deed would include rules for its redemption. In other words, let's assume you were destitute, you sold your land, the use of your land to somebody else. That contract would, on the, on the outside of the scroll would be the rules by which it could be redeemed by a relative. If a few years went by and you had a benefactor in the family that was willing to redeem that land for you, they could perform and pay the guy for the unused years and get it back. That's the concept of redemption, okay? And so the rules for redemption would be inscribed on the outside of that scroll. That's why when you see a scroll written within and on the backside, that implies it's a title deed, okay? And, and so the law required that if your next of kin would show up, there was some procedure by which you could purchase back. That was called redeeming the land. And the land is to be redeemed back to, its, to the one it was originally signed. To give you an example of this, a strange example, in Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah the prophet knew that the Babylonian captivity was about to begin and it would be 70 years. He was a prophet. He, he wrote that down. 
God instructs him to go buy some land before going into captivity. Well, that's pretty stupid. He's going to go into captivity for more than the rest of his lifetime. In other words, he would, he's already elderly, and the tra captivity would be 70 years. But he's instructed to go and buy this land. And it makes no sense. It's not explained. All you need to know is that title deed then would be buried in a jar, and his relatives would come back and unpack that jar, pull that out, and perform whatever it said, and regain that land. It's the part that it's not written you need to understand to understand why he's doing that. It was a testimony to Jeremiah and those around him that they would return. He wouldn't, but his family would. That's what it's, it's a, it was a, a promise. It was like a, a, a favorable prophecy, if you will. So after captivity, Jeremiah's descendants will come back and claim the land. The title deed would be a scroll on the back of which would detail the procedure. The whole concept becomes important. You need to understand all that when you get to Revelation chapter 5. Because our Lord stand, comes forth. Who is able to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And I wept much because no, found, no man was found. It had to be a kinsman. No man was found worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof. And one of the elders said, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open book and loose the seals thereof. And I turned, and I saw the lamb as it had been slain. I thought it was the lion of the tribe of Judah. No, it's the lamb, same thing, see? The lion of the tribe of Judah, reigning king. The lamb that had been slain, that's the lamb that was nailed to a cross. The thorn-crowned one will come and open that book and take possession of that which he was paid for. He's redeeming the land that will occur in Revelation. The whole, the whole picture of Revelation 5 will become clear if you understand this process. There's another law you need to understand to understand what transpires here. and It also is essential to understand much of what goes on in the Old Testament. And that's the Leverite marriage. Deuteronomy 25. The word levir, by the way, is foreign to us in Latin. It means a husband's brother. This is not Levitical. It's levir. It's a different word. It levir, Leverite marriage, is when, is, 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 takes place when a situation where there's a widow whose husband has died, obviously, and has no children. Her husband passed away with no children. She could go to the next of kin and put a claim on him to take her to wife to raise up children for the family. That was to preserve inheritance within the tribe. He didn't have to do it. It was an opportunity that he would have. If he did, they would call the Leverite marriage. That's where the widow is able to marry her dead husband's brother. Okay? And he had to meet three conditions to do that. First, he had to be a near kinsman. Couldn't be just anybody. He had to be the next of kin. Secondly, he had to be able to perform. If he's broke or already married or some other problem, he didn't have to. He had to be able to. And finally, he had to be willing. It wasn't required. He had a choice to make because it might have impact on his own situation. But if she had made that request, he had the opportunity. And that's going to take place here in chapter 4. Some things happen first. If he chose not to avail himself of this opportunity, he would memorialize that by taking off his shoe and giving her, if, if he doesn't choose to marry her, he gives her his shoe. That was a sign of uh, shame. She would, the procedure, she would spit in his eye, take a shoe and be on it. That was, that was, that was a done. He would go barefoot for the rest of the day. That was because he didn't step up to that opportunity. As years go by, they skip the spitting part, but still he would give her a shoe. And we're going to see that take place in chapter 4. Because that shoe to the guy passing was an object of shame. But to the next of kin, it was a marriage license. So we'll see about that next time. Or no, a couple times. Sorry. So the laws of ancient, the law of gleaning, you need to understand for chapter 2. We've just been through that. The Leverite marriage for chapter 3. And the law of redemption for chapter 4. One of the blessings of this book is that after going through it, you'll have a grasp of these peculiar procedures upon which much of the Old Testament depends. The claims of Christ hang up on these laws. There is a very peculiar thing with the um, blood curse on Jeconiah that we will deal with next time that uh, the claims of Christ hang on. Again, the Leverite marriage. So for your next session, I want you to review the law of redemption that we've just read in Levit Leviticus 25.
47 to 55. The law of Leverite marriage in De Deuteronomy 25. It's Leviticus 25 for the one, Deuteronomy 25 for the other. And then study very carefully Ruth chapter 3. And as you do, be prepared. There is an event. There's an event in chapter 3 that is widely misunderstood to the uninformed. There's an event that looks like she's proposing something illicit. Not at all. It sounds like she's, you know, making an indecent proposal to Boaz. No, it's far worse than that. You'll see when you get into it. But don't be misunderstood. There's a widely misunderstood thing. I think it's in verse 9, chapter 3. You'll see when you get there, and we'll study that next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. We ought to praise God. Let's kind of bless us. I teach you a lesson. And yeah, we're going to praise God. Yeah, yeah. Uh. We ought to praise God. Let's kind of bless us. I teach you a lesson. And yeah, we're going to praise God. Yeah. Oh, we're going to praise God. Let's kind of bless us. I teach you a lesson. And yeah, we're going to praise God.